Hi, welcome back. My name is Michelle Snyder, and I'm a person whose life has been dramatically changed by the Lord Jesus Christ. I teach a Bible study on Monday nights to a small group of women, and we have such a good time together. And I'm a conference speaker. I, I love every opportunity I can get, uh, ladies' retreats, whatever, to just go out there and proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's done so much for me absolutely turned my life around when I was 25 years old. Um, I'm a blog writer. I talk about my experiences with him. Some of them are, are kind of funny and, and some are very poignant and, and uh, deep and meaningful. Um, so you can check that out at inthesunroom.wordpress.com and it's sun, S-O-N, all one word, inthesunroom.wordpress.com. Com. I hope you'll go there and, and read some of my articles. But for now, we're going to get back into um, James chapter 5. You know, you got to love that guy, James. Isn't he hilarious? <laughs> I mean, he isn't. He's not funny. But I mean, just to watch his spunk and his, as we called it, chutzpah at Bible study. I mean, he, he just speaks it out and he doesn't care who gets upset or um, what he, he's not, he doesn't care if he's liked or not. He's just speaking the truth of the Word of God, which is exactly what John the Baptist did, Elijah, and so many others who ended up getting in a lot of trouble because they were speaking the truth. And you've got to admire people like that. You know, those of us like me who tend to be a little more timid and merciful, um, we that the, we need that too, don't we? That's the beauty of the body of Christ. But boy, I love those people who can just speak it out and just blurt it out, and and they're usually uh, criticized quite heavily and considered to be crazy. Can you imagine Elijah um, and um, John the Baptist and James and guys like Luther? Uh, these these people that um, were so outspoken and can you imagine how they would do you think about some of the words that they've spoken and how that would be handled in in America today in the United States I'll tell you what a lot of people would think they were kooks uh, and off their rocker completely just listen to this we're starting out with James chapter 5 verses 1 through 3 that's where I'm going to read and this is James talking and he's talking to people who are uh, proclaiming to be Christians, uh, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they have a few issues, and, you know, Jesus said that in the end he's going to separate the wheat from the tares. The Holy Spirit will separate the wheat from the tares. We oftentimes don't know who uh, is uh, uh, the wheat and who is the tare. We don't know that, but the Holy Spirit, mark my words, he knows. And uh, all we can do as believers is to just be fruit inspectors. You know, if a person is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be fruit. And it's kind of like an apple tree, though. An apple tree doesn't have to really think. A root, if you planted a little root um, of an apple tree, it doesn't have to work and toil and, and spin and try to be... Uh, try to produce apples, it just will, right? And it's the same way, and that's what James has been saying all along. It's the same way uh, as a believer. Good works will just flow from us. Are we going to be perfect? Absolutely not, because we know we all still battle with that old, ugly sin issue, the old carnal man that still lives inside each one of us. Uh, but I'm talking about living in a pattern of sinfulness. And so James is, is confronting um, a certain set of so-called believers here. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Ooh, he sounds kind of angry here, doesn't he? You have heaped up treasure in the last days. And that word treasure, he's being a little sarcastic there, isn't he? Uh, it reminds me again of John the Baptist where he says, you brood of vipers. And in fact, Jesus himself used that term. Um, so that's, that's just the kind of guy James was. He does not want us to claim to be Christians and live in a pattern of life that would uh, state otherwise to the world, to unbelievers who are out there watching. 
Um, his harsh words, again, like I said, are not directed to uh, true brothers, but um, they are directed to those who are playing church. They're using their money, um, and they're, they're um, exploiting others who are working for them, and they're just being very um, unbiblical Christians in the ways that they're dealing with other people, and they're assuming that their money will ensure heaven for them. So he goes on to verse 4 and says, Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Think about cattle. They're out there just, um, you know, lavishing uh, having every this food just lavished upon them, and and uh, they're getting fattened up. They're living in in luxury and ease, and uh, they're just getting fatter and fatter and fatter. But why are they being fattened up? It's because they're headed to the slaughter, and that's what James is saying here. You guys are headed to the slaughter. You don't even know it right now. You're comfortable and you think everything's cool. But uh, your day is coming, and you will stand before God and answer to him. Verse 6 says, You have condemned, you have murdered the just, he does not resist you. So let's go on to verse 7 and 8. Shifting gears now, he's talking now to believers. And uh, he says, you know, there will be rip-offs. We'll read that verse in a minute. There will be rip-offs. There will be unfairness in life. But he says, keep in mind that the Lord is coming. He sees what is going on, and he will settle the score. You know, Jesus says that in this world we'll have many tribulations. Didn't he say that? And it's not an easy walk in the park. And especially so if you're a believer, because we come, we're come, we counter, almost these days, not almost, but we are uh, counterculture, and it's not easy. And um, so we are going to have tri trials and tribulations, and and people do rip us off, and people do mistreat us, and there are injustices. But he's saying, God sees. And Jesus is coming back, back again, and folks will answer for uh, what they've done to those who are less fortunate, as he goes uh, referring back to verse 4. Um, but I just love the fact that we do worship a God who sees, ladies. And isn't that a comforting thought? Think of Hagar as she was out there in the wilderness and had run away and was fearful. And do you ever feel, feel fearful? Do you ever wonder, you know, um, do you ever wonder if God is even paying attention? And Hagar had that question, but yet she is the one who named him Jehovah El Roy. He is the God who sees. And it might appear that uh, things People are getting away with things and things, you know, are not fair in your life. But just take comfort in knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ will one day, and it could be today, return for us and that there will be a day of accountability. And so just let go of it. Whatever it is that's eating at you today, let it go and just know that it will be taken care of in time. In the meantime, our job is to occupy our job is to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and that can only come because we are all so susceptible. I am so susceptible to just falling into negative thinking and feeling like, you know, I've just got to talk about it. I've got to just, you know, I'm just irritated and there's no, um, there's no resolution. There's no hope of a resolution. And I just get frustrated and and uh, carry on like someone who doesn't even know the Lord, you know, if no, if nowhere else, at least in my own thoughts. And so, you know, First John one nine, he's faithful to confess, or he's faithful to forgive us when we have cast. And if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just uh, to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we just take it to him and say, Lord, I know. I'm trying to hold on to this. I'm grasping. I want to make it right. And I know I can't. There's no way. And so help me, Lord, just to peel my fingers open 
that grasp that I have on this thing that's upsetting me so much and just take it from me. Help me to surrender it to you. I confess my sin of trying to take charge in this situation. I release it to you right now, Lord Jesus. And he will take it. Verse 7 says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Oh, ladies, that's our blessed hope, isn't it? See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And so, you know, when you see something that's wrong, oh, if ladies, if we could only just let it roll off our backs like water off a duck's back, that is what brings honor and glory to the Lord. And when you don't have it in you to do that, ask Him to give you that ability. I ask Him all the time, Lord, help me. Will you exchange this negativity for uh, your positive love, for your compassion? Help me to see this situation through your eyes. And believe me, He'll do it. He will do it for you. He will intervene. But we have to give Him a chance. You know, He's a gentleman. He steps back and He waits patiently. But all we can find comfort in knowing that the Lord will return and that all the wrongs will be made right. And we can hold on to that. Um, there are times when we can do little but to be patient and determine not to give up. This doesn't mean, though, that we don't resist the devil, right? Because we know he's a roaring lion and he's out there uh, wanting to devour whomever he can. And um, so we, we, while realizing that God is sovereign and he is the blessed controller of all things, we also need to walk circumspectly, knowing that our enemy, the devil, is out there wandering around, uh, going to and fro and trying to stir up his mischief. But we know that um, who, won, who wins this battle, don't we? We know who the ultimate victor is, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can look forward to that day. But he says to wait patiently in faith for the coming of Jesus. So be patient uh, and just pray for the mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life, in your family's life, and all of those that are um, involved with you and connected with you. Uh, and believe me, he will do it. Verse 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Again, don't grumble when you see something that's wrong. Oh, Lord, help me too. Help me not to grumble. Help me to know that the judge is standing at the door, as it says in verse 9. I'm not the judge, and I'm so glad I'm not. Um, he, he, but he is, and he'll make it right. So stick to the big picture, ladies. Live for the kingdom of God. And every day when you get up, look for his coming, because it could be today. Verse 10 goes on and says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the intended by and, and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate. And merciful. Isn't it wonderful that we serve a God who is compassionate and merciful? Oh, my ladies, how many times in a day do I need to call upon that compassion and mercy in my own life? Well, Job was a wealthy man. We've been talking about wealthy people here, and it's not, it's not a sin to be wealthy, but it is a sin to uh, mistreat those who are less fortunate. And um, but, boy, what a, what a wonderful thing it would be to, to be blessed with money. And actually, we here in America are. Every one of us is wealthier than 80% um, of the world. I went to the Philippines uh, a year ago, maybe almost a year ago, and uh, the poverty I saw there was heartbreaking. And I came back with a whole new understanding of what it means to be poor. And... Um, but Job was a wealthy man, and, and but we all know the story. He lost everything, and but in the end, he ended up with twice as much, didn't he? Because he was patient. He didn't fight it. He didn't toil and spin. He just released it, 
and blessed God. And that's what God wants us to do. Not that Job didn't have periods of doubt and periods of questioning God. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. We are human, and God understands that. He knows our frame, and he knows our, our weakness. Um, but Job is an example of a man who endured difficulty uh, and one who was rewarded greatly in the end. Oh, I'm so glad God put that story, that the Holy Spirit breathed that story into his word for us because it's given so many of us uh, comfort and encouragement over the years, hasn't it? Um, verse 11, again, I, I want to refer to that. Only Job's suffering, in his suffering, could he be intimately uh, experiencing the and comprehending the Lord's mercy and compassion. And isn't that true? You know, when life is going along well for us, uh, we don't even think about his mercy and compassion. But boy, when we're in the dire straits, that's when we see God work, and that's when we, we see all of his most wonderful attributes. Let's look at verse 12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, and with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, yes, lest you fall into judgment. Originally, um, swearing was an attempt to involve the character and the authority of God to support a claim or uh, to support a promise. That comes out in Leviticus 19.12 and Deuteronomy 23.23, 23, if you want to look those up. But then, as often is the case, you know, and today especially, the Lord's name um, has become debased. Uh, you hear people say it all the time, I swear to God, you know, and that is taking the Lord's name in vain. He's saying, don't do that. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be a person of integrity so that when you say something, people know that it is as you say it is um, and that you have prom your promise is true, uh, that you will do what you will say you do. You don't need to say, I swear to God. Um, and he, he's saying that, that it's um, using his word to uh, excessively, using it excessively that way is um, to emphasize a trivial point is wrong. So just let your yes be yes, your no be no. James cites Jesus in Matthew uh, 537 insisting that we should have integrity and uh, what we utter uh, that you know comes from our mouth should just uh, should be the truth, and that we would not fail to perform that. Um, otherwise, it just kind of just besmirches the name of God uh, to observers and those who who don't know Him and those we're trying to win to Him. The Bible tells us that in the multitude of words, there lacks not sin. Read Proverbs ten nineteen. The more we talk the more trouble we get into. Have you guys noticed that? So James very practically says that we are to keep our speech as simple and as straightforward as possible. And that's as far as we got Monday night, and uh, that was to verse 13. So we will uh, pick back up with verse 13. It's been really nice to see you back again. Um, we've, we've resumed um, after the holidays, and we're back on full Zoom again now. So it's been really nice to uh, see you, nice to be with you, and the Lord bless you as you go out into your world to make a big splash for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we will see you next week. Bye, ladies.